From the garage of his childhood home to the pinnacle of global tech innovation, Steve Jobs was more than just the co-founder of Apple, he was a visionary who revolutionized several industries. Journey with us as we dive deep into the extraordinary life and legacy of a man whose relentless passion and relentless innovation transform the way we think, work, and communicate. Steve Jobs was adopted by Paul and Clara Jobs. They had made a promise to his biological mother that he would attend college. Eager to keep this promise, they used up their life savings to pay for his education. However, just six months into college, Steve felt it wasn't the right fit for him and decided to drop out. He didn't leave college entirely, though and started taking various courses to discover his true passion. During his high school years, Steve had become friends with Steve Wozniak. In 1972, Wozniak created a digital blue box that could manipulate the phone system to make free long-distance calls. Steve saw a business opportunity in this. The two began selling these boxes, and although they stopped after a close encounter with the police, they managed to earn about $6,000. Steve later mentioned that if it weren't for their blue box business, Apple might never have been born. A year later in 1973, Wozniak designed his own version of the game Pong. After he was done, he gave it to Steve, who then took this game to Atari in Los Gatos. Mistaking Steve as the creator, Atari offered him a job as a technician. Steve Jobs, always on a quest for self-discovery, took a break to travel to India in 1974, along with his friend and future Apple colleague Daniel Kotke, to study Buddhism. After spending seven months in India, Jobs returned to the US, leaving before Kotke did. He rejoined Atari, where he worked on creating a circuit board for the game Breakout. He again turned to Wozniak for help, who was working at HP during the day. So, by day, Wozniak sketched circuit designs, and by night, he and Jobs would work on refining them at Atari. Around the same period, the Altair 8800 was introduced, a computer kit that customers assembled themselves, but it was essentially non-functional in terms of everyday computing. This changed when Bill Gates and Paul Allen introduced the BASIC programming language, turning the Altair 8800 into a tool for basic calculations. Seeing the potential, Jobs recognized a business opportunity. He approached his friend Steve Wozniak, and the duo began attending the Homebrew Computer Club meetings in Menlo Park, California, starting in 1975. This club was a gathering of computer enthusiasts and hobbyists, but to make their vision a reality, they needed funds. Jobs sold his Volkswagen car, and Wozniak sold his HP Scientific Calculator. With that seed money, they teamed up with Ronald Wayne and founded Apple Computer Company on April 1st, 1976. The birthplace of Apple was the garage of Jobs' parents in Palo Alto, California. The name Apple was inspired by Jobs' time at the All One Farm Commune in Oregon, where he spent time in an apple orchard. Have you ever had a passion project you thought about turning into a business? Let us know in the comments below. Steve Wozniak designed a groundbreaking computer that had a typewriter-style keyboard and could be connected to a regular TV. This invention, later named the Apple I, laid the foundation for future computers. But Wozniak didn't want to change the world. He just wanted to showcase what he had achieved with limited resources. Jobs then struck a deal with the Byte Shop, agreeing to sell them 50 Apple I computers for $666.66 each. But there was a problem. Wozniak and Wayne didn't have the funds to fulfill this order. So, Jobs approached a parts supplier, Kramer Electronics, with a proposal and presented his cash-on-delivery purchase order from the bite shop. Convincing Kramer to give him the parts on credit, Jobs assured them that he'd pay once the computers were delivered to the bite shop. But when Paul Terrell, the bike shop's owner, received the 200 units of Apple I, he was taken aback. He had expected complete computers, but instead got motherboards. Customers would need their own computer, power supply, and TV to operate the Apple I. 
Terrell was upset, but he still bought and paid for the units. For a year, the trio sold the Apple One without essentials like a monitor, keyboard, or case. It wasn't until 1977 that these were included with the computers. Steve Jobs and Wozniak owned 45% of Apple each, while Wayne had 10%. Soon after starting, Wayne sold his 10% for just $800. He was the man behind Apple's first logo and the Apple One manual. In 1977, Jobs met Mike Markula, who gave Apple a loan of $250,000 and became a one-third owner of the company. Markula not only provided funding, but also introduced Apple to significant industry players. One of them was Arthur Rock, a big name in venture capital. He decided to invest $60,000 and joined Apple's board. However, not everything went smoothly. Jobs wasn't thrilled when Markula brought in Mike Scott from National Semiconductor in 1977 to be Apple's first president and CEO. As the dust settled on these early decisions, Apple's vision started to crystallize. With success in sight, they released the Apple II which came with its own screen and colorful graphics. The two Steves showcased it at the West Coast Computer Fair in April 1977. After the success of Apple II, Apple III soon followed. While Apple focused on this new text-based computer, another team was making a different kind of machine, called Lisa. This machine gave birth to terms like mouse, icon, and desktop. In 1980, Apple partnered with IBM to launch Apple III. Every day, Apple's founders saw their wealth grow. Steve Jobs believed the future was in easy-to-use computers. So, in 1983, he introduced the Apple Lisa, the first computer with a visual interface. However, it didn't sell well because of its high price and limited apps. At 23, Steve Jobs was already a millionaire. By 25, he had over $250 million. He became one of the youngest to be on the Forbes richest list. By 1981, Apple was one of the top three computer companies. In 1983, Steve Wozniak left Apple. Jobs then brought in John Scully, a former PepsiCo president, as CEO to help the company grow. By 1984, Apple had shown that it could compete, even with big names like IBM. Apple I and II were big hits, but Apple III and Lisa? Not so much. That meant Apple needed a big win, and it had to come soon. In 1984, Apple released the Macintosh 128K. It started strong, but sales slowed because of its high price, speed, and lack of software. Jobs knew the Macintosh was special. For its big reveal, he wanted an unforgettable ad during Super Bowl 18. The ad boldly challenged IBM, Apple's biggest rival. Two days after the ad, the Macintosh went on sale, featuring MacWrite and Mac Paint to showcase its capabilities. However, disagreements arose between Jobs and CEO John Scully. Scully restructured Apple, putting Gasset in charge of computers and naming Jobs as chairman a role that distanced Jobs from daily operations. By September 17, 1985, Jobs had resigned from Apple. He took five Apple leaders with him and started Next, investing $7 million. Later, billionaire Ross Perot saw potential in Next and invested a huge amount. In 1986, Jobs bought the Graphics Group, later called Pixar, from Lucasfilm for $10 million. Five million of this amount was allocated to purchase the company, while the remaining five million was used to secure the rights to technology from Lucasfilm. Pixar's first big movie with Disney was Toy Story in 1995. In 1996, when Pixar went public, Jobs' 10% shares were worth $1 billion by the end of day one. By 1990, Next computers weren't selling well. In 1993, Next stopped making computers and focused on software. They created the Next Step operating system. At the same time, Apple was navigating tough waters. Their products weren't resonating with consumers as they once did, and financial difficulties loomed. Recognizing the potential of the Next Step operating system and perhaps seeing an opportunity to bring jobs back into the fold, Apple decided to buy Next for $430 million in 1996. This acquisition wasn't just about software. It was a homecoming for Jobs. In February 1997, Jobs was back at Apple as the CEO. 
He stopped some projects, like Newton and Cyberdog. Apple was in desperate need of a product to rejuvenate its image and fortunes. The answer came in the form of the iMac in 1998. Sleek, colorful, and user-friendly, the iMac was a hit. The public's response was overwhelming, with Apple selling more than 800,000 units within the first five months of its release. The company was back on track. Steve Jobs once said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. When have you experienced a setback that only made sense later on in your journey? In 2001, huge things happened for Apple. They opened their first stores in Virginia and California. They also released the Mac OS X and the iPod. By 2003, Apple launched iTunes, quickly becoming the top place to buy music digitally. 2007 was another excellent year. Apple unveiled the iPhone, their first touchscreen phone, and it went on sale on June 28th. This phone eliminated the one thing that Steve Jobs hated from the start, buttons. It was such a hit that by 2010, they introduced the iPad, a tablet powerful enough to replace a computer. In the midst of all this success, Jobs faced personal challenges. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2003. Despite this, in 2005, he delivered a moving speech to Stanford University graduates, remembered as one of his best. Jobs initially refused surgery for his cancer, not wanting to be operated on. Jobs also refused to take any medications, only relying on herbal ways to beat his disease. Despite his illness, Jobs remained deeply involved with Apple, pushing boundaries and guiding its innovative streak. However, his health deteriorated over time. By 2011, he had to step back, and Tim Cook, a trusted executive who had been with Apple since 1999, took over. Jobs continued to participate as chairman, but unfortunately he passed away later that year, marking the end of an era for Apple and the tech industry at large. He had a private funeral surrounded by his family and friends on October 7, 2011, at the Alta Mesa Memorial Park in Palo Alto, California. Many thought Apple would decline after Steve Jobs' passing, but Tim Cook showed that wasn't the case. In 2011, Apple introduced Siri, the virtual assistant. By 2015, they launched the Apple Watch. A year later, wireless buds or AirPods were released. Which Apple products have been your favorite? Let us know in the comments. As of the end of 2020, Apple was worth $65.34 billion, and by March 15, 2021, its market value was a whopping $2.08 trillion. Today, Apple has a net worth of $2.72 trillion. Steve Jobs wasn't just an entrepreneur. He was a game changer. His work and vision transformed industries. From modest beginnings, he built the world's most valuable brand. His legacy is one for the history books. Where do you see Apple in the next 10 years? Are there any wild predictions or hopes for innovative products? Until next time.